Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Stacey Allison Casson. Um, I'm a librarian at York University in Toronto, uh, Canada. I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, uh, I'll just also say right off the top that um, I'm um, a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, which is a recognized Indigenous uh, nation in Canada. Um, also, um, the talk today, I'm not going to show a lot of cool tools or things like that. It is about a conversation, sort of picking up on um, the talk in our, uh, that we just heard around issues around Indigenous content, Indigenous people, Indigenous culture in um, Wikidata and Wikibase. And I really want us to think about a couple of key issues. Uh, one is the relationship between the data structures we uh, create and maintain and issues related to human rights and equity. Um, so we should think, uh, we talk a lot about equity in terms of gaps um, and accessibility, but there are other ways that we can also think about equity in our projects. Um, so the ways that we can use Wikidata as a space for activism, uh, making the world better for more people, and modeling is hard, yet fun. Um, so I want to talk about modeling, hopefully you want to talk about modeling um, a little bit. And um, yeah, sort of invite you into this conversation. I think we are going to hold uh, some of the questions to the end. But um, uh, I also want to acknowledge that what I'm talking about today is not you know, just my own thoughts, that this is really building on I mean, meetings like this where we get to talk together about things. In particular, I want to call out uh, the Canadian Federation of Library Associations and Indigenous Matters Joint Working Group on subject headings and classifications that is doing work uh, inten intensely on this project right now. Also the National Indigenous Knowledges and Language Alliance uh, data modeling subgroup um, and specifically uh, Camille Callison uh, who's uh, from the Taltan Nation at the University of Manitoba, Dean Seaman at the University of Victoria, Tim Knight, who's with me at York University, and Alyssa Cherry, who's at the Museum for Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. So what I want to center my talk today on is uh, this idea of sovereignty and nationhood in relation to Indigenous peoples and how this impacts how we think about our data models. So I want to talk a little bit about colonization. So for those of us who are from colonized nations, we have particular ways that we might think about how colonization impacts um, um, peoples and land. So we know that one of the goals of colonization is actually to remove the occupants of the land so that people can come and either settle that land, they can engage in resource extraction activities, um, they're opening up the land for agriculture um, and other forms of habitation, and we know that this is not in the past. This is ongoing today. We know that there are active things happening in the world right now which are seeking to remove occupants from land, sometimes lands they've occupied for thousands of years in order to engage in um, these activities. And uh, we know that colonial states um, engage in activities to assure their control over territory. And we heard a little bit about this this morning in relation to language. So we know that languages aren't endangered just through natural causes, that there are deliberate actions taken by governments or nation states to eradicate language in very deliberate ways because language is connected to sovereignty. It's connected to saying that there is a culture and people are active in this culture and occupying this space. When we think about how small languages come to be small. Um, so I might get a little emotional about these, <laughs> these issues, but you know, this, these are the kinds of things that are really important. Culture uh, deliberately being eradicated and people, uh, col uh, colonial nations involved in acts of genocide in, all, in various kinds of ways. So that's a very serious topic, but it does actually impact the kind of work that we do and I think is a thread that runs through how we think about the importance of culture and the, and the way that dominant culture is deployed within all kinds of uh, cultural institutions. So a couple examples from Canada. There's many I could name, but I'll just name a couple. So currently there's um, sort of fights taking place in um, the province of British Columbia where the government of Canada in, um, and corporations are trying to build pipelines through indigenous territory. And uh, the um, hereditary chiefs of, of the uh, Wet'suwet'en Nation is, does not want the pipeline built through the, the, their territory, but the, the government is actually arresting people who are protesting, even though they're on their land. Um, 
The Indian Act in Canada was instituted as a deliberate way to engage in um, uh, assimilation, so state-based assimilation tactics. This is again through the removal of language and culture. Uh, ceremony was outlawed, so practicing your your traditional ceremonies, the traditional governance structures for First Nations was outlawed. Uh, a pass system was introduced, so people were not allowed to leave their reserves without a pass. So you think about all the ways that those those methods or or the sovereignty of a nation being um, actively worked against, and the, again, these cultures of a, these tactics of assimilation. Um, and then, of course, many people here might know about the residential school system in Canada, which was a, a people a children being sent to boarding schools, where it was again deliberate acts of um, assimilation, where you were um, sort of stripped of your language, of your clothing, um, not allowed contact with your families, and that's very deliberate. So again, going back to the keynote we heard this morning about. Uh, parents choosing to pass on their language, well, wh that choice is taken away when children are sent away to school. So that has long-lasting uh, intergenerational impacts on the ways that um, families work and on culture. So um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, came out with calls to action, um, some of those deliberately calling out um, cultural heritage and education in, in some of these places where colonial uh, practices are actually uh, ongoing. Um, so recognizing the right to self-govern and to autonomy and sovereignty over land, that's very important. Um, so it also governs our relationships between nations. So in we might uh, use in Canada quite often this idea of nation-to-nation -nation relationships. So uh, that recognizes that the government of Canada is a nation, but within Canada there are also multiple nations. So when we have uh, First Nation um, engaging in, in uh, negotiation with the government, that's considered a nation-to-nation -nation, um, uh, relationship. Many Indigenous people in Canada do not recognize Canadian citizenship. They do not want to be associated with, can, with being Canadian. I know when I was writing, if I write Wikipedia articles about uh, Indigenous uh, folks that I know, uh, one thing I have heard repeatedly is do not say I'm from Canada. I don't want to be, you know, so-and-so is, a, you know, an artist in Canada or is a Canadian, no. So what does it mean when we take that person and we, put, we have a Wikidata item for them and we say that their citizenship is Canadian? You know, that's actually an act of violence against that, I mean, it sounds very serious, but it, but it is, because we are saying that person who is actively working to resist um, that, uh, that um, colonial, um, the colonial system, and then we are saying in their data, oh, but they're Canadian. Well, I want to be able to run a Sparkle query against them to bring up all the Canadians. Like, well, that would be useful, but what does it mean when we sort of replicate these kinds of, of things in our data? So recognizing Indigenous sovereignty is an important aspect in creating a more just and equitable world, even though we might not get the kinds of data that we might want. So, um, so if we're going to take the strategic areas of knowledge equity seriously, we also need to pay attention to the structures in our data. So again, we tend to think along uh, gaps like the gender gap, visibility gaps, small language, and marginalized communities, but why, when we think about why are these communities small? Or what does it mean when we have these gaps? And we have to, again, think about the structures and how we're conceptualized in our data and how we're treating, just like the example of the photograph. You know, again, why is that, why is that so bothersome to the Sami community? It's because, yet again, culture being appropriated. You know, culture being, them being misnamed. Or, or again, and we see in Canada uh, a return to the original traditional names of territory. And so all of these things are really important. And we have to think about um, how we can center these practices in the work that we're doing. So again, I just want to emphasize that belonging to a nation is not the same thing as belonging to an ethnicity. Um, I know sometimes that we think about those things as being the same, but they're not. So again, it's thinking about the relationship between um, nationhood and na a nationality, belonging to a nation, and citizenship and the governance structure that goes with that is different than the ways we think about um, ethnicity. Um, and again, just to stress again, that it then becomes a, a conversation around relationships between nations, governance, land, and people. So if we think about colonization as an act of removing people 
from their land or reducing their sovereignty over the territory they occupy, how can we, in the data that we're produce, recognize um, that uh, that these nations um, have a, a have a, a are occupying a particular uh, spot? If we if we aren't talking about nationhood, then we actually um, and we talk about a territory, then we make those people absent um, um, from that, that territory, whether they're presently there or not. So again, another thing to think about is how we document occupation over time uh, as well, because one of the things that you hear about, especially in reference to places like North America, is that, well, no one was there. It was a vast wilderness of unoccupied... Well, that's not true. People have been living in North America for for thousands of years. I have ancestors who have been living in Canada for or the area of Canada for thousands of years. So these are not, it's not an unoccupied space that people just came in and discovered. So this concept of discovery is helpful in the ways that we think about um, uh, the colonial um, uh, uh, practices. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself because I feel like I can. Um, again, it's about being respectful. I don't want to talk about someone else's nations. I'm going to talk about my own um, a little bit. So um, this is a picture of me and my dad. And uh, so my um, grandmother, my dad's mom, um, is a, a Métis. And I just again, in reference to the conversation this morning, she did not uh, teach her language to my dad. She was living away from her community. And it was definitely a thing where you were not uh, you, you, she did not want to talk about being Indigenous. That was, a, that was not a safe pl thing to be in the community that she was in. I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario. I don't know how many people have here. Probably not. Too. Anyway, it's not known. It's known for having pretty serious problems with racism. Um, and so that was uh, uh, her choice. This is a, a picture of the, the young man standing in the back there. Is my great-grandfather. Um, and, uh, and the document on the on the far side there I just um, want to talk about the ways that um, so you have this problem of of uh, indigeneity or these kinds of of uh, well of culture being suppressed in various ways um, but in the process of cultural recovery or in resurgence or um, wanting to be connected with a particular nation, sometimes that becomes a form of documentation. So how do you prove you're a member? I mean, they're saying you have connections to the community, but a lot of that is through documentation. So this far document here is called, uh, is the Métis Petition of 1840 from the Penetanguishing area. And it's around when treaties were being signed in that uh, area, settlers were starting to come in, they wanted the land, so they had to have a treaty so they could move all the indigenous people, First Nations people to an area to free up the land for settlers. Uh, that's a very crude um, way of talking about it. And this document is actually um, signed by some of my ancestors who, uh, it's a letter to the Lieutenant Governor at the time saying, wait a minute, because they, it's called the half-breed uh, petition. So this is, they're saying, wait a minute, we, we are um, uh, you know, native also. We should get, uh, we should be included because they were, they called it Indian presence. They wanted to be included in, um, uh, in the uh, negotiations that were going on. Um, but uh, the reason, so this became a very important document presently in showing that this community was expressing an indigenous uh, identity because the Métis were not, were not recognized by the government as, a, uh, as an indigenous um, people until fairly recently. So all of this is about, about uh, left, being um, outside of those uh, negotiations. And so one thing about this document is it's in a collection, a digital collection. It took me forever to find it because it's just a scan of a uh, microfiche. So it's just like a, there's nothing, there's no way, so this is the super important document, lots of people want to see it, and there's no metadata in this collection that connects, there's actually just zero metadata, it's just like a long roll of things related to uh, correspondence uh, related to the British government at that time. So when we think about how also we can surface documents in particular way that are important to uh, recognizing, again, the existence of Indigenous people in particular areas is another thing that becomes really important. 
Um, so, move, so again, this is talking about my own nation. When we talk about um, ways that we might conceptualize uh, nationhood or territories, this is actually a map of, of uh, what the Métis Nation of Ontario has designated as harvesting territories. So that's actually related to hunting uh, and fishing um, rights. And in, in that was negotiated between the government of Ontario and the Métis Nation of Ontario. The captains of the hunt are the people who oversee that, um, all of these activities. And so this, so although I live in Toronto, which is actually down here, this is my, uh, this would be considered my traditional harvesting territory because that's where I can tie my ancestors um, to. So when we think about how we might model that kind of things, when we're thinking again about uh, structures in our data, we need to recognize community roles that also have um, ties to uh, territory. Um, and then, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, again, we don't have, um, not all Indigenous peoples agree on what is someone's territory. So there are disputes between um, different things. So recently, the Métis National Council um, has decided that this is the map of the Métis Nation in Canada. Uh, this does not recognize uh, Métis people in uh, British Columbia or in some parts of Ontario. So these other places are saying, wait a minute, we don't agree with this map. So um, one of the things is who, again, who decides or how are we going to negotiate between, is it, is it actually allowing for multiplicity of, of um, and then the First Nations people whose uh, land, this territory, this covers, were like, well, you didn't ask us about this map. So there is there is also thinking about the ways that we need to negotiate between claims on territory, how we might document those claims, but also um, allowing for recognition that there is overlapping um, kinds of ways that we consider um, um, territory. Um, so I just wanted to um, post this uh, quote because I think it's a um, really good way of talking about how um, colonization, we don't notice it because it is, you know, in, in many places it is the dominant culture. It's the dominant way we think about um, the world. We don't necessarily notice these kinds of things. So again, when we think about the perspectives of the marginalized. So again, when we're talking um, with all of us, when we think about our data models and our data structures, how do we allow for properties or items that maybe we don't think are important, but are actually vitally important for all kinds of marginalized communities? And this goes beyond indigenous communities. This speaks to all kinds of marginalized people. Um, and so we have to think about the ways that we can use our data structures to um, address some of these issues and to become a space where we actually are working for, for justice um, within our um, data, data structures. Okay, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I forgot to put my timer on. Oh my goodness, okay. So, <laughs> it's got five minutes. So I'm gonna speed through some examples. I do have real life examples. So, um, so we're, I'm working with the, with the, as part of a member of the, um, the CFLA Indigenous Matters Group and NICLA, we're working on the development of a First Nations Métis and Inuit ontology. Um, we have developed this list. Um, this is just a little sample of all the kinds of things that we're collecting of what we're calling community names. Um, we had a soft launch of this data on um, June 21st for National Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and we are going to be hopefully deploying this um, within Wikibase. Um, is the plan. Um, we have some stuff in there, but we've, <laughs> I think we're going to have to just wipe it and start over um, because we're really, you know, what we've come to, to realize where part of our work really lies is in the data modeling. So we really need to be thinking about our data structures and how we are going to um, conceptualize that data within um, uh, the wiki, wiki base environment. Part of this is also related to wiki data. So, um, uh, I've kind of been ignoring some parts of Wikidata because I kind of don't want to have to deal with some of it. Uh, <laughs> I'll just be really honest. Um, so there is nation in um, Wikidata. So one of the questions I would have is if you have uh, Jibwe, is that an eth we are currently I think there's an ethnic group. Is it an ethnic group? Is it a nation? Is it both those things? Do we have both those things at the same time? 
Um, I think that's a, that's a question I have not yet figured out how to answer. Um, we do have something called native land um, in Wikidata. When I first looked at it a couple of days ago, so maybe last week, I kind of stumbled on it. And it actually was an instance of an isolated human settlement. So um, maybe not the best way to describe something that is called native land. So, uh, again, when we're thinking about it, maybe it's, it's good to sort of check in with somebody. Um, I wanted to show this example of Anishinaabe. So Anishinaabe, uh, here it's an ethnic group. I would say it's also a nation, but it's a nation that also contains other nations. So it's actually based on kind of a language group, but contains the nations of um, Ojibwe, Ottawa, um, and a number of other uh, groups within that. So how do we think about, uh, I don't want to say hierarchy, but there's a way of, of uh, a relationship has to be designated there. Also, some, but, uh, one of the things in that um, item is a, a link to the official website for the Anishinaabe Nation. That's not, uh, the ethnic group doesn't have an official website. So um, do we have Anishinaabe Mech Nation as a as an organization, and then we have a, a nation, and then we have so there's a lot of modeling questions that I have around how we might want to work this out. Um, this is another example of a uh, archival item in the rec in the item uh, record for this um, document. There's no actually reference to Cherokee peoples or how this information was collected. So we might want to think about how we relate some of these documents, especially when they come from a colonial um, uh, government, how they are documented in uh, Wikidata. And I just want to close with this quote, which is, I, you know, this idea of solidarity, how do we stand in solidarity with uh, all kinds of communities in our larger community? And how do we recognize, again, these places where we really need to be um, sensitive um, and also recognizing that some of these um, issues for some communities are, are vitally important and it really does matter how someone is called or how someone is conceptualized um, within our data because it, it, it does uh, matter what you see but also how it impacts the uh, larger sort of internet and world um, around us and I'll close with that. Thanks. So thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, I invite back all of our presenters. Uh, so if there are que any questions, we've got lots of time. We made them uh, you know, uh, cramp a bit their, their presentation in order to let you uh, express your opinions or your questions, uh, et cetera. Also, thank you, John, for, for your work. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a question there. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Dragan from Rhizome, and I wanted to ask Stacy, uh, um, what is your um, view or experience with, with data itself being kind of colonial? Because sometimes I have the impression that, um, especially the things that seem ambiguous, rec are reflected in data with the most descriptions, and this like kind of uh, the, the idea of data to remove ambiguity is kind of so something that, that has uh, struck me, and I wonder, especially when you see these disputed, uh, dis disputed territories, maybe ne no one ever cared about it before, but now you have to describe it, and then suddenly it becomes a problem. So how, what is your... Yeah, I feel like this is my life. So I was a cataloger for me. I don't know if anybody else here is a, as you know, I'm a librarian, I worked as a cataloger. You can never get it right. It always feels like you're always going to be... Um, it, there's, no, there's no right answer in a way there's only attempts and but I do think that one of the issues is that um, all of our structures that we work with are colonial and express power in different ways and so um, there's no way that we it's no way there's we can't really decolonize I will say our our um, many of our systems because they are that's just the way they are from like when we think about museums or libraries or or um, even uh, sets of data that it's built into the into the code in some ways. So where are points for resistance and recognition within some of those systems and how do we work to change, make systemic change from the beginning when we think about ways that we um, start off. So there's, um, I don't know, it's like a, a scale <laughs> of like better and worse things and so, but I think if we're operating from a point of of consultation, of respect, of recognizing 
um, human rights, when we, you know, when we take those things to account, and how can we push our organizations to do better. So one of the reasons that we started with the, having this ontology is because it's actually to replace Library of Congress terminology in our libraries because in Canada we often use Library of Congress terms, those terms are developed for Congress in the United States, they often don't fit the Canadian experience, like the heading for Indigenous people is, in, for First Nations people is Indians of North America still, and we have little hope that the government of the United States is really vested in changing those terms. <laughs> so it's part of, you know, given that, what can we do, and, and it, it, it is, you know, to develop uh, our own ontology that people can use to replace those terms. So. Um, I don't know if that's a great answer, but there. But I think there isn't. There is. We're always in those structures. So what can we do, in at various various kinds of points? I have a question. Whoops, for all of you. Um, how do you deal with pushback when someone might say, "Well, this is the answer in a Western peer-reviewed journal. This is how they call the people." of 1890, and you're saying that this is inaccurate, but where do you have your proof when here it is in a Western peer-reviewed journal? How do you deal with that kind of pushback? Uh, who wants to go first? <laughs> I'm not sure which one of us is less likely to talk. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, this is a horrible question, actually. it's a, I mean, it's a wonderful question at the same time. It's but. For instance, if you look at the Sami, I recommend each and every one of you today to go look at the Wikipedias and look at the different ones and see what they call the Sami. The Sami call themselves Sami. The Sap Malash and Northern Sami, Sap Malash and, and Skolt Sami. And the Spanish Wikipedia, it's Lap. <laughs> it's, and Lap is a horribly racist word. And there is a huge discussion about this in the Spanish and Catalan Wikipedias about what you can say. Well, Sami is not in our language. And I know it's been used in, and I used to live in, in Barcelona, I know it's used in Catalan, Sami. And they, the Wikipedias have decided they're, they're going to use the racist word instead because it's not, it's not in any peer-reviewed article somewhere. So. Yes. So, um, <laughs> but I mean, that, I mean, we have this session here today, and part of it is like we invite the community to think about these things and how we can. I mean, what do you think we should do? I mean, part of it is how what what is the appropriate evidence? If it's used in one peer review journal, do we have to collect evidence somewhere else? How do we encourage the community again to think about their responsibility in in um, in this space and and it's uh, maybe a long process and uh, but when there are things are I think that's something especially on commons when we have images I know there are lots for North America that are really problematic and people will say well it's public domain so I mean I think that's a, that's a really good um, you know I don't have a quick or easy answer yeah I would like to be a little bit optimistic with Wikidata because well, I like Wikidata. Uh, I think that um, the, th uh, the per perfect side of it is that we can express different views. We can we can display the peer-reviewed uh, terminology, but we c we can contest it with other evidence. So I think this is well. It leaves the responsibility to the uh, to the respondent, but still, it gives new opportunities. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, two things I was going to mention, but the one is uh, one of them is the one you just said that uh, for situations where, like you spoke about the Canadian citizenship problem, that can certainly be entered as, you know, can, uh, his, uh, his citizenship is Canadian claimed by the Canadian government or whatever this is, and have a different thing that says his citizenship is something else or even unknown or even no value. If, if we don't have a nation, uh, if, na if the nation is not allowed by Wikidata in there, which is a different discussion that I guess you probably ha will have to have at some point. Uh, so this is perfectly doable in that sense. I mean, the person is probably still going to be unhappy that the Canadian citizenship is listed at all, 
but at least you can show them that. So it's listed as not the universal truth, but only as one of the possible opinions. Another thing I wanted to bring up for a moment is something I was talking to Kimberly earlier, and I mean, it was kind of run through through the slides because of uh, the time concerns. It's like, so this is a, this part was easier in the sense that okay, if you have two different things and you can put the two things there and it's okay, but what happens for cases where the community does not want this knowledge to be public at all? Indigenous community. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think there's space for us to work on privacy sensitive data and identifying those and finding out ways and uh, ways to handle uh, content that we find or the communities find problematic. And it's a, it's a la large discussion. Uh, and it has a lot of uh, legal aspects, it has a lot of ethical aspects, and it ties to copyright as well, and uh, the ownership of, uh, of the content. So, um, well, um, lots of things to say about that. Yeah, well, and I will also say that you just, I mean, <laughs> really just mention, I mean, the copyright, that copyright regimes that we are familiar with are colonial, yeah. right? They d it, there's actually like a huge friction between um, copyright regimes that are used in most countries and traditional knowledge. I think, I think we have to maybe be comfortable sometimes with deleting content. It, even that we say, well, it's public domain. Well, public domain has ne does not necessarily have a meaning in a tr in a indigenous community or in a in certain communities. So, what does it mean when you when um, again when we go back to this idea of of sovereignty and recognizing human rights when we say. You know, I was at a, a meeting um, that the, the Canadian government was um, sponsoring on the copyright regi regime in Canada and Indigenous knowledge, and and someone said, and it just really has stuck, stayed with me since that meeting: um, human rights before property rights. You know, again, it's like if we are taking human rights as our prime motivator and prime way that we're thinking, then some of these other questions become easier to answer because we have to value um, um, humans. In, in a way, all humans, and so we can't say that their property rights or something like public domain should come, come before that, and it's hard. It's hard for many of us who are all about access to things, access to documents, because it's against what we feel like we should do, but um, in some ways I think that's, that's the direction for certain kinds of content, because a lot of things were collected by um, you know, um, anthropologists for example, and some of those things, uh, books or photographs are now in public domain and uh, uploaded into Commons. Okay, so uh, our session is over. There was one more question from the gentleman from the back, but, okay, <laughs> sorry. I, I really apologize for this, so thank you. Yeah, also, oh. Yeah. We have a meetup tomorrow at uh, 11.30, I think. If you want to talk more about Indigenous issues, come on out. So, yeah.